I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this. Intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hi, everyone. This is Kristen Sinanta Walker, and I am so excited to have our next guest, Dr. George Simon. Many of you, uh, which (laughs) I know it's a lot of you, um, know about all of our shows that we do on narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder. So if you don't know Dr. Simon by name, you'll know the books I'm going to mention. In Sheep's Clothing, Character Disturbance, The Judas Syndrome, How Did We End Up Here?, best-selling books. This is a topic that's been around for a long time and especially the epidemic that it has become today. Dr. George Simon, thank you so much for being on the show. Kristen, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And we're going to be doing this regu- regularly, which we'll call it Character Matters with Dr. George Simon. And we'll just cover, you know, different topics because there's just a plethora of things to talk about when it comes to character mattering, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, if ever there were a time in our history where it matters, uh, I think this is it. Because, you know, just a few ounces of enriched plutonium in the long hand, in the wrong hands could do uh, could end it all uh, for a lot of us. So uh, character matters. It always has. It always will. And when we decide to make it matter uh, again and we and we get honest with ourselves about what it's going to take uh, to help ensure that we build decency of character uh, into one another, then uh, we'll be all right. Otherwise, we, we might just not make it. Right, exactly. Why do you think that so many people um, can have can be so against the basic principles that are laid out by someone where character cl- clearly does not matter, and people where character does matter to them will tear in a blind eye and choose to not see what's right before their eyes? Well, we are raised in an aggressive culture. Uh, And it's not just us. The whole world has been transformed in the last several decades. Uh, The culture has become one of uh, kind of a survival of the fittest, uh, uh, aggressive mentality, where people only care about uh, their own agendas and advancing their own agendas. So um, a a, a perfect example would be, I think, uh, our, our last election. You know, when people think they're going to get their agendas served, if somebody promises them the moon, promises that they'll do this and that for them, they're willing to set their obvious concerns about character aside because it means more to them to have their agendas served. Uh, And this even happens in relationships these days. You know, a a person comes into a relationship, the other partner uh, has a history, maybe three or four failed uh, marriages or other relationships, Uh, but they bring something to the table. They do something for the other person, and the person is willing to set aside character concerns for whatever it is they think they're going to get out of the relationship. And then wonder of wonders, before long, they're miserable. And why are they miserable? (laughs) Because they're in a relationship with a schmuck. Well, go (laughs) fish. (laughs) 
<laughs> and schmuck can be male or female. <laughs> male or female. That's correct. Hmm. Yeah, and it takes a long time, especially if you're someone who was raised by schmucks. It mm -hmm. takes a long time to, um, you know, see things clearly because if you were raised kind of in an upside down world, it's that's how you were raised. This is right. this is your example. And the culture doesn't support anything different. You know, we have mm -hmm. such a massive sense of entitlement. Oh, so, my gosh. Well, you know, whatever we think we want, you know, we should we not only are determined to have, but we think we should have it just because we want it. We don't give concern. We don't uh, give adequate uh, thought and concern to whether or not it's really good for us. Or, and especially, and this is the more important thing where character is concerned, not just whether it's really good for me in the long run, but what it's good, whether it's good for everybody. You know, we are innately very social creatures. We really can't do it without one another. We, we are inter interdependent whether we like it or not or whether we recognize it or not. And everything we do affects one another. Uh, so we, we unfortunately learn these lessons the hard way, but we don't seem to profit very much from experience. And I think that's because we live in such a character disturbed age where so many facets of our culture promote this kind of um, entitled thinking. Uh, and um, we have a vicious cycle kind of going on where, whereby cultural value erosion has fostered more character disturbance. And because there's more character disturbance in the culture, there's further erosion <laughs> of right. those values and standards that typically were used to build character. I, I can think of one really uh, easy example. I know that I'm old. Uh, Kristen, I, I, I'm 70 years old, so I, I know that by many people's standards today, that's old. Right. But I can remember when, uh, say, on professional sports teams, I can remember that someone, uh, a time when someone could be as talented as all get out, ha have every potential of having a team win a national championship just by having that person on the team. They had that much talent, but the powers that be within the organization weren't going to run the risk that that person who they saw had serious character flaws might tarnish the image, the good name of the team might be bad for morale or whatever the case may be. And so it didn't seem to matter what natural gifts you had if you didn't have the character you weren't going to get in. You weren't mm. going to be paid outrageous sums of money to right. potentially cause a shipwreck. I can remember when character mattered. <laughs> um, and uh, we've seen the effects uh, of a change in our culture. You know, we really have. And I always find it interesting where, you know, something will happen even, you know, in my organization, a mental health organization where, you know, someone is not saying who they really are and you learn you know you see this behavior over time of course because no one is immune to these kind of people and when I finally said ah okay I get what's going on now and I lay the hammer down and say you are not welcome here anymore people are shocked yeah, yeah. well you could have just quietly let them go on their way um no and I I didn't you know put those two words together character matters but is that that's true character matters the character of me and the character of my company you know i also have found in my work you know a, a lot of my fellow clinicians i give workshops all across the country and a lot of my fellow clinicians uh, have kind of thrown in the towel they think that uh, nothing works when it comes to intervening with character disturbance and uh, the, the best any relationship partner can do is leave and uh, uh, the best a therapist can do is throw up their hands and uh, and see bright insightful uh, cooperative clients and, and just let the character impaired go because nothing works. That's a popular perception out there among professionals. The biggest problem is uh, has been our approach. My experience has been, uh, after doing this for over 35 years, I consider myself 
abundantly blessed because I've been able to do two things that most clinicians can't say that they have done. I have helped empower people who have been in really bad, one-down situations in toxic relationships. I've helped them claim a life and empower themselves and, 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 and carve out whole new territory for themselves. And I've also helped people with serious character flaws become more decent people. I, so I don't know how it gets any better than that. But what I had to do is I had to change my mindset. Mm. I, had to, I had to dispel just about every single preconceived notion that I had about how to help people change based in our old paradigms. For example, I had to dispel the notion that calling someone right from the get-go on their dysfunctional manner of relating or their disturbing attitudes or their screwy way of thinking about things. I was taught you do that right off the bat, you're going to lose uh, the ability to establish any kind of a relationship with the person. <laughs> I'm what sorry. Learned, my, my thought on that is, well, wouldn't you want to lose any kind of yeah, Well, well <laughs> my, my experience has been just the opposite. When you're willing to be truthful right from the get-go, it's not like the other person, it's not like the character impaired person doesn't know it anyway. So when you do that, you establish a bond of trust. Now, they may not be ready to work with you just then, mm -hmm. but they also know that you can't be snowed right. and that you know what you're talking about and you can see right through the pretenses, et cetera, et cetera. So when the time is right, who do you think they're going to work with? Right. They're going to work with the person they trust and who's willing to call it, say it as it is. That's what I've learned. So just about everything I was taught about how to work with, uh, shall we say, the overly hung up, overly conscientious uh, neurotic types, everything I was taught about how to work with these folks doesn't apply when you're working with character impaired folks. Um, mm -hmm. And when you kind of get that as a clinician and you're willing to take a different path, um, you can do some real good. That's what I've found out. That's interesting, too. And I know we had talked about this previously before we started to do this, because there are so many people that will hear and that believe. And I, I understand why, because they're in deep trauma. I was there, too, that you can't help these people. There is no hope whatsoever. And it, and I've actually had someone yell at another counselor on a phone call with me who said she was taking a course about how to work. She's a clinician. So she was taking a clinical course on how to work effectively in treatment with someone that is character disordered. And the other person on the phone yelled, very upset. That's a lie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So That's a very common perception and, and, yeah. and, and well rooted in some history. You know, mm -hmm. so many people who have sought help from counselors who don't get it uh, and who are, do not have the proper um, training and orientation to do some good have experienced what we call therapy induced trauma. Uh, in other words, they went for the help and they ended up feeling worse for the effort. Uh, right. Maybe maybe their uh, maybe their relationship partner was a good what we call impression manager, knew how to turn on the charm and knew how to put forth the best face, and manipulated the heck out of the uh, the uh, therapist impression management wise, uh, only to make the person uh, who's the more conscientious party in the relationship feel even worse and feel like maybe they're. Uh, partly or mostly to blame. So who who can blame folks for having developed those uh, attitudes? And, and who can blame clinicians, for example, who used every single thing that they were taught to try to make things better and they didn't work? Well, that's the fault of the tools. <laughs> that's, but they didn't know that. So they it's, it's natural for them to assume, well, nothing works. Right. Right, exactly. And if you're on the receiving end of of this for years and years and years and years and years, and you finally get out, you're angry and rightly so for a very long time. Sure. And understandably so. Uh, dealing with an impaired character is an exasperating experience and it takes its toll. Uh, it, it's really a, a trauma experience. Mm -hmm. So most toxic relationship survivors are trauma survivors and they have all of the features of post-traumatic stress that any other trauma survivor 
has not, not the uh, not the least of which is that lingering uh, you mentioned gaslighting effect or that right. sense of unreality of not really being able to be sure anymore what's true and what isn't what's real and what isn't that's a really uncomfortable uh, feeling to have and it's a it's a pervasive one that kind of creates a chronic anxiety in folks absolutely I remember a therapist sitting with me and and saying what why didn't you, what made you finally wake up to one of my parents behavior you know what what was it what was the thing that that made you finally wake up to it and um, I said I you know, when you're a kid, you live with the person. And so all the crazy, horrific stuff that's going on is just part of your experience that you grow up with. Then you run as fast as you can, like I did as an adult, and you get away from them. And so you're not around them for a long time. And I said, I was around them for, for quite a few years as an adult. And the amount of work that I do doing these kinds of shows about this topic was glaring in my head constantly while I was watching their behavior that they've always had, but for whatever mm -hmm. reason, it finally went, it finally, you know, clicked. And I went, oh, this is yeah. exactly what we talk about. And I woke up. So I had gone to a friend of mine that's known one of my parents for, you know, 30 some years and said, is it that this is crazier than it's ever been? Or, you know, what's the deal? And he said, They've always been this way, always been this way. You just couldn't see it until you can see it. And and that in itself makes you feel like you can't trust yourself to determine what is reality. Absolutely. You know, you, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that I've written uh, several articles on my blog at uh, what well, either URL will take you to the same place, drgeorgesimon.com or manipulative-people.com. I've written several articles on that, on that loss of trust. And that's also one of the chapters in my book, How Did We End Up Here? That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the thing that happens to most relationship survivors uh, in character-disturbed relationships, is they lose that sense of trust. They don't know what's real anymore, and they don't trust their judgment anymore because they wonder, how, how could they have had it so wrong yeah. uh, for so long? And now that they think they see it right, how sure can they be uh, right. and, and how, how do they avoid a similar pitfall in the future with someone else? And or is there anyone else that you've been ignoring or, or unclear about red flags with that are walking around in your life currently that you're going to go wake up and have another, Oh my gosh, I didn't see that one either. It's a very right. real fear, very real fear. Right. So that's why I, uh, that's really why I wrote uh, each of my books. I wrote in sheep's clothing because um, to take off the mask of these very skillful manipulators, I wanted to equate people very uh, specifically with their favorite tactics. Once you know how a person tends to operate, once you recognize the, uh, the little antics that they use, the ways that they prey on your sensitivities and emotions, and especially your conscientiousness, once you re recognize that and you say, yeah, oh yeah, I, I've seen that, I've seen that behavior, yes, I'm on the receiving end of that behavior, then it all begins to make sense. And then you know how to recognize the next time or any time in any situation when somebody is that kind of personality. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. That's true. You certainly, um, I, I tell people, well, I don't carry, um, you know, horrible, heavy luggage around with tons of past baggage because I've been in therapy in and out of therapy and I will continue to do that for a long time. But I don't carry that as much as I used to. But what I do carry around proudly is this wonderful toolbox that has all these great tools that help me figure out who the heck it is I'm actually dealing with and how to get away from them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, you know, uh, Kristen, that is something, too, that I at my workshops, I I really um, notice in the uh, in the audience uh, a bit of tension when I address one issue. Clinicians are pretty bad about something, by and large, in the mental health field. 
In medicine, they teach students, not just in psychiatry, but all of medicine. They teach an axiom from the very first day of medical school. And that axiom is that intervention in the absence of and not in accordance with sound diagnosis is the very definition of malpractice. I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous, and they're just good people. And also my genetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. Think about it for a minute. Intervening without knowing what you've got. Doing anything to a patient without knowing what it is that you're treating. And getting it right about what you're treating. Is the very definition of malpractice. That's how people get sued for malpractice. Now think about the mental health field and how many times folks sit down and just start talking. And with a kind of an attitude, well, we'll figure this out later. It's uh, it's a very interesting kind of mindset that has dominated mental health for a long time. Hmm. So it's just as big an axiom in therapy uh, really, as it is in any relationship, you got to know who you're dealing with and right. you got to call it right before you really get started. Otherwise, you're going to mess up. It's really pretty much that simple. How would a therapist know, though, when someone is so good? I mean, they are, they have been playing this game and they are really if they're, you know, they, they are Academy Award winning actors in, in their fantasy world of, of yeah. you know, character disturbed behavior. So how, how would a therapist know? Because what I've found fascinating is there's, you know, there's some people that, you know, say, well, I've been with my therapist for years and they've actually gotten worse. Yeah. And I think, what is that therapist doing? Yeah, but yeah, the yeah. person that you shows know, that up sitting really- in the chair... Yeah, that's a really great question, uh, Kristen. And in my workshops, I I tell my attendees, I ask the question, how many of my attendees in their clinical training ever got the chance to be behind a one-way glass and observe a session in in progress? And about a third of them, maybe sometimes a half, will raise their hand. And I always uh, jokingly say, weren't you just an absolute genius behind that window? Because, you know, when you're taking the observing kind of stance and you can witness a process going on, you can be a lot more objective when you're actually in the process and the person is doing their manipulative technique and performing it on you and doing their impression management and casting their best impressions and using all their 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 tactics and manipulations, you can be swayed. Mm -hmm. And, And so how you how you get that right is that you get so familiar with the various uh, modus operandi, the way these folks tend to operate, and how to spot and appropriately label the specific behaviors that give them away that they prefer to do, uh, and then properly categorize them. And, and to do that, you have to not just be engaged with them, but you also simultaneously have to put yourself behind the glass in kind of an observational uh, mode and be saying to yourself, okay, what's this all about? What's this person really trying to tell me? How are they really trying to come across? Is there a game going on here? 
you have to ask those questions and you have to have the, that mindset because we live in a very different age. Almost everyone, almost everyone has some degree of character impairment. That doesn't mean everybody has a full-blown character disorder. But people's problems today are far more related to their character impairments than to anything else. I, I tell my workshop attendees that we're no longer in the Victorian era where all our, our dominant uh, paradigms, psychology paradigms, were formulated. But back in the Victorian era, if there were a motto or a slogan for the time that would describe its cultural climate or zeitgeist, it would be, don't even think about it. So people were incredibly, as we children of the 60s used to say, hung up about everything. They, they, uh, they had unreasonable fears and insecurities and, and uh, underlying emotional conflicts. They, they had such oppressive consciences because the society was so incredibly uh, repressive uh, that they were literally making themselves sick with unnecessary worry. Well, the exact opposite is true today. If there were a motto or a slogan that would best describe the cultural climate of the, or the zeitgeist of the past several decades, it would be like the old Nike commercial used to say, just do it. Right. So, so instead of people being uh, so overly hung up that they're making themselves sick with worry and unnecessary feelings of guilt and shame and whatnot, most people today, their lives are a shipwreck because they're not quite hung up, hung up enough right. about the things that they let themselves do. Uh, and they don't have enough conscientiousness. So uh, it's, a, it's a spectrum phenomenon, character disturbances. It varies in intensity and quality and degree. But that's the bigger problem today. Uh, and so it requires a whole different framework. And like I said, you have to familiarize yourself with all the various character types, the ways they tend to operate, the tactics they prefer to use to impression manage others. And once you get that, you can put yourself kind of in a, in a simultaneous ob observing kind of stance when you meet somebody and get to working with them. You can take a step back and kind of look at the process and say, OK, what kind of person do I have here? Is this the overly conscientious type who is going to be vulnerable to the character impaired? Or is this the character impaired type who is somewhere on the spectrum of character disturbance, maybe even a full-blown character disorder? And once you've got that right, then you know how to intervene. Hmm. And you have to realize, too, and I don't mean you, I mean all of us have to realize, too, that some of the most incredible tactics of those who are character disturbed are that they are applying for sainthood. And so it is very difficult <laughs> 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 to determine that, you know, because they can pretend like they are overly conscientious. They can pretend that they truly do care. And um, and what you've got underneath that, you have to look at, OK, well, how is it that they've treated people, you know, over the course of their lives? Um, Absolutely. That's right. Be behavior always tells the story. And it's also, by the way, the best predictor of future behavior. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you, uh, you know, talk, as they say, is uh, cheap. cheap. <laughs> <laughs> behavior is always the better predictor. I know so many people, so many well-meaning but awfully Pollyanna-ish individuals who got into a relationship thinking, yeah, I know, that marriage failed and this other marriage failed. And this, I, I know, I know, but it's going to be different with me. Right. I just know it's going to be different with me. Well, oh, what's yeah. changed in the meantime? <laughs> and if any of the same behaviors are there, you know, it's wishful thinking. It's wishful thinking. It is. It's a lot of magical thinking. And that's an interesting thing when you get two different types of people together. Um, the one that will, the one that, I guess my question before I ask the one I was going to is, do you think that many character disturbed people know that they are pulling the wool over 
someone's eyes or that that they're that a lot of them are just acting out of their disturbance Mm -hmm. they don't actually know that they're disturbed to the level that they are in my book in sheep's clothing i make the point that while there are those individuals who truly inadvertently manipulate because they've got issues going on within themselves that they don't even fully understand uh, and they are truly in the classic sense acting out a drama that they don't really consciously get Um, there are such individuals but it is not safe in our day and age to to assume that those kinds of individuals are anywhere near the majority it's not safe Uh, Most folks these days know exactly what they're doing and why Uh, they're comfortable with it. It's worked for them. Um, And, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little uneasy about this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it because I have, you know, during the campaign, during the last campaign, I I did an interview for um, Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. just before the election. And uh, that interview uh, was, uh, I don't know the technical journalistic term, but it was farmed out to Psychology Today, to uh, Esquire, to several several other publications published the same interview uh, and quoted the, the same things. And I was erroneously quoted in a number of ways, but the one thing they got right is I had built this archive uh, of, from the campaign, because when I go to give workshops, advanced training workshops, on what it looks like to have a certain character disturbance, I usually hire student actors at local drama schools to act out vignettes. Mm. Uh, and, and this costs a bit of money, and I, frankly, the vignettes are good enough to illustrate, but they're not really perfect examples. Well, During the campaign, we had several perfect examples (laughs) of what certain character pathology looks like. So I compiled this archive, and not just of our current president, as I was erroneously uh, quoted as saying, Uh, but uh, I had uh, several of of, uh, Donald Trump where he acknowledged he knows very well what people say about him and his personality. It's Mm -hmm. not like he doesn't get it. I use a couple of rhyming phrases in my workshops. I say the problem is not that they don't see. There isn't a thing you can tell them that they haven't heard a thousand times before. The problem is they see but disagree with the mindset that you'd like them to adopt. They've heard it all before. They think their way of doing things is best it's worked for them right uh, so they have no incentive you know if you've made a couple of billion dollars and and you you have all this power and influence and somebody tries to tell you you're doing it all wrong they're just gonna laugh at you right it, it's not that they don't see it's such that they just simply kindly disagree and maybe sometimes not so kindly and i also say that it's not so much that they're not aware The bigger problem is that even though they're aware, they don't care. Yes. That lack of empathy and positive regard for other people and other people's vulnerabilities and other people's concerns is the bigger problem with character disturbance. So in that they don't care, there's so much around, you know, there are things that they do seem to care about above more than others, using Trump as an example. We've talked about him many times on my show. Um, You know, he seems to have uh, his daughter as an example, as his one of his his golden child, and then that one can do no wrong, but he's got terrible praise, or not not praise, but terrible um, treatment of of his sons. And so it's, they pick and choose who they're going to care about, but I always think it doesn't have anything to do with that person it's how that person reflects on them <laughs> well exactly and you see even she has fallen into some disfavor lately because she's spoken her mind <laughs> well well not only that because you see 
what she did that was so so incredibly good in in the narcissist's eyes is that she picked somebody just like him and um that of course was to her great credit now this somebody who uh looked at one time to be just like him is proving to have some flaws mm -hmm. and so she didn't do so good uh, and, and those flaws have to do not with his character because he is just like him but that he wasn't shrewd enough smart enough to avoid right, um, getting caught. yeah exactly so uh so now that she's screwed up she doesn't have quite as much favor that's you know, true it's, it, it's for the narcissist it's all about the reflection on them right they, you know the tale the mythical tale from which we get that term is very telling uh, the, the mythologists there really got it right. Our sister simply could not love anybody else but himself. Uh, he, he was only in love with his own reflection. And you know, there's another character in that story. Do you remember? Do you remember the mythical tale? I do, but go ahead for our listeners. The, well, the, yeah, the the other character, central character, is is Echo. She's mm -hmm. a nymph. You know, and in Greek mythology, there. are they're the ordinary heroes, and then they're the superheroes, and the superheroes, they're, they're fortunate enough to have all the nymphs chasing after them. And uh, Echo pursues Narcissus relentlessly, but he is unfazed because he's already found all that he needs with respect to emotional fulfillment in himself. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the examples, uh, I'll use this, one of the examples in my video archive that I used to demonstrate that. You can't make this stuff up, but it's the interview that uh, Trump had during the campaign with Mika Brzezinski on the uh, Morning Joe program on MSNBC. And uh, I don't know if you remember this, but Mika asked him the question, who is it that you turn to for advice on foreign affairs? Who's your go-to person? And do you remember what his answer was? I do, but please share. So every, anyone that doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah. I ask myself primarily. Yeah, that was the, uh, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. I could hire some students to act out the media, but it doesn't come across as powerfully as somebody actually doing it in the flesh. So there's you almost this. can't believe it. Absolutely. And there's this, there's this belief out there that people that you know have narcissistic personality disorder as an example that they loathe themselves and this is this behavior is as they're acting out of their their wounds and it, it's all you know that they actually care about themselves more than anyone else is it true and tell us a little I, bit about I'm the flavor of that yeah <laughs> i'm so glad you mentioned that you know when i was doing my clinical case study research before I wrote both In Sheep's Clothing and Character Disturbance. I knew that I had seen in my practice over all the years, I knew that I had seen two very, very different types of narcissists. Mm. I had seen those narcissists who were exactly as you described and that we, we used to assume was the only kind of narcissist out there, the kind that underneath it all was very insecure, had a very fragile sense of self, had some degree of self-loathing and therefore needed constant adulation, yes. uh, external validation to build themselves up. I had seen those folks, those needy kinds of narcissists that we uh, now recognize do exist, but they're in the minority in our day and time. And so in my book, because the literature as yet did not recognize that there were two types of narcissists, I called them the more classically neurotic type versus what I called the more character impaired type mm. that is exactly the opposite. These people really do believe in their greatness and they're not compensating for anything. Uh, and it, it can be founded in some fact and it can be founded in absolutely no fact, but they just know they're all that and they don't care what anybody else thinks of them. Uh, and their, their sense of self is inflated and it's not, compensatory to any underlying insecurity uh, or, or uh, a poor self-image. It's not that at all. Uh, and so now the literature, actually the professional literature recognizes that that is true. 
we discovered it th 35 years ago, but the literature is pretty solid now, that there really are two types of narcissists. And in our day and time, uh, the character disturbed narcissist is the much more common uh, one. And especially that type is more common in men. Apparently, the insecure, vulnerable types uh, still exist a little bit more prominently in women. Um, Interesting. So, and yeah. so the character disturbed types are the ones that are most likely never going to seek treatment. Oh, not without some pressure. Yeah. They're, not they're, they're, without. They've lost their money, their families, fallen, whatever it is that they've deemed is very important in terms of how it looks as a reflection of them. If that's being taken away, then maybe they'll do a modicum amount of therapy. But if yeah. but without that something looming, hanging over their head like a possible yeah. prison sentence, yeah. they're just not going to do it because there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. I can't count the number of cases that I've had in my professional career where it's taken just that. As a matter of fact, I, I have some folks still doing their time in, in, in prison, several folks. But they uh, they had begun to make the substantial changes that they needed to before they actually had to serve out their sentence. But it took something like that or some other kind of major tragedy, complete financial disasters, something, something that that basically where I don't know if you want to be religious about this or not, but uh, something where people would say God's grace was such that he uh, allowed basically the bottom to fall out and allowed them to, allowed them to crash and burn to mm -hmm. the point where they finally had to say, you know what? I thought I had the world by the tail and I thought I'd figured it all out. And I thought that I knew exactly what was working for me. And you know what? Now I actually have to consider that it wasn't working all that well at all. And maybe, just maybe, I need to start questioning my direction, uh, my attitudes, my core beliefs, my ways of thinking about things, my ways of doing things. Maybe I just didn't have it so right after all. It usually <laughs> takes a pretty rock bottom hitting event, you know, That's to make that happen. About. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, you know, there's 8,000 more questions I want to ask you. And this is so funny because this is how I get on shows where I get to speak with with people that um, that are like you just full of knowledge. I'm like, oh, I got to ask this. And then I have to remind myself, we're going to be doing more shows. <laughs> you don't have to ask them all today. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I'm getting about 12 to 13 emails every single day from folks who are missing my former program because um, I allowed folk, I, I was able to take live calls too. And people would write through my blog and uh, they miss that ability to do what we're doing right now. And, and that well, is that frank uh, conversation. So uh, I, yeah. I, I, I posted on my blog that we are working on it. Uh, and <laughs> We are, and we we absolutely can set this up to where we can take live calls. Absolutely. So uh, we'll we'll get a few of these ones under our belt. Just to introduce my listeners, and then we'll open this up to a live call format. That'll be that'll be wonderful. Well, Dr. George Simon, I know your website is Dr. George Simon at like Simon says S I M O N, um, and that's got yeah, that's the D R G E R G E. Yep, Simon. Yep. And I want to say the books again, please, listeners. All of them are wonderful. Um, I The first one that I read was In Sheep's Clothing, and it was one of those books where I went, oh, my gosh. Okay, this is what I've been dealing with. <laughs> <laughs> but the names of the books are In Sheep's Clothing, Character Disturbance, The Judas Syndrome, and how did we end up here? The um, blog is wonderful. I get the email updates uh, for your newsletter that comes out, George, and they're fantastic. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on my show and for allowing us to have a continued conversation about this because it's never more needed than it is in today's times. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, Kristen. And I, I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the next opportunity. So absolutely. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you to our listeners for another edition of Character Matters with Dr. George Simon on Mental Health News Radio.
aggressive but never without good intentions i heat up and act on my emotions thanks so much for listening to mental health news radio our podcast can be found on itunes stitcher and hundreds of other podcast apps or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com if you have a question or would like to be a guest become a podcaster on our network or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you, babe. After all we promised, we'd be cordial.